Hi, Senator. Senator Carson, you should be all set on YouTube. Thank you very much, Aaron. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Senator Sharon Carson from District 14. Today, we will be holding a meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Before we get started, I'll read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the Judiciary Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that one, we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selective legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. Two, we have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. Three, we are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remote senate at leg.state.nh.us or call 603-271-6931. Four, in the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Five, please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Six, finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you during the meeting, which is required under the right to know law. I will call the roll. Senator Gannon. Senator Gannon in Sandown in my home office, fired up, ready to go. Sounds great. Senator French. Harold French, Senator District 7, once again broadcasting live from the offices here in Concord, New Hampshire, that I share with Attorney Sullivan. He is in the building. Thank you. Senator Kahn. Uh, present in Keene, and uh, my wife will arrive sometime shortly. Uh, and uh, good to see you folks again. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. And Senator Whitley? Good afternoon, Senator Becky Whitley. I am in my home in Hopkinton. Uh, I'm alone in the room, but there are members of my family in the house. Thank you. And Senator Carson, I am at my home in Londonderry. My daughter is in the room with me. And a cat who might get a little vocal. He seems to be very talkative today. So, okay, we're gonna uh, start the day by opening up the public hearing on Senate Bill 179 and recognize the prime sponsor, Representative Abbas. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Judiciary Committee. I am Representative Daryl Abbas and I represent Rockingham County District 8 and I am the prime sponsor of House Bill 179. Uh, this bill may sound familiar to, to some of some of the members of the committee uh, it is an exact copy of what was Senate Bill 743 from last term that was amended uh, and was tabled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The, what this bill would do, it extends the terms of imprisonment for any person that's been convicted, that is convicted of negligent homicide or aggravate, an aggravated driving while intoxicated when the driver has previously been convicted of driving while intoxicated. The, section that is referring to the aggravated 
provision uh, specifically only applies to situations where the aggravated provision was uh, involved a in an accident or a collision with a motor vehicle that resulted in seriously bodily injury. So I came across this, this bill when it was in the Senate just by chance due to a similar title to another bill that uh, although they both involved driving uh, and drunk, drunk driving, they were actually very different. But I signed in support of it last term. Uh, it was a, a, the sponsor of the bill, uh, the senator who sponsored the last term is no longer in the Senate. So I, taking an interest in the bill, decided to uh, refile it, and it did pass in the House uh, uh, recently. And that's how it made it this way. So what this would really only focus on is individuals who have a prior conviction, and it will enhance that penalty. Uh, specifically, if you if the prior conviction, uh, is an extended penalty can be for if you have one prior conviction for 10 years, but not more than 20, if the, if a person has two convictions, then that extended term of imprisonment could be uh, 15 to 30 years. That is something that would, is at the discretion of the prosecutor. They would have to notify the, the defense, the defendant within tw 21 days of, I believe, a, a trial that they, it's their intention to seek the enhanced penalties. It does allow the discretion and what the, Benefit of that is that it really can, this could apply to egregious circumstances where uh, situations like this could have been avoided. Uh, what gave, uh, inspired this law, and it, it was, and if you see the amendment, I understand that it's not always preferred to have a, in a, a title to an amendment with someone's name, but um, Mr. Tyler Shaw was tragically killed by a drunk driver. It, the original Senate bill did have that title in it, uh, that the amendment in the House was simply to add that title, uh, Mr. Shaw's mother uh, did testify before the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee and gave us a background on Mr. Shaw's uh, tragic death. Uh, he was killed by a drunk driver who had two prior convictions uh, on his record. Um, and ultimately what happened in that case, it, the situation in my opinion could have been avoided. When someone is convicted, they uh, are required to uh, take uh, classes to get their license back. They're required to go through a program. If it's not known already that their conduct was very dangerous and put lives at risk, uh, after getting their license back, continued to engage in behavior that poses a threat to public safety. This is uh, to, to deter that type of behavior and also to allow, situ when you have situations where the uh, circumstances are very egregious, I mean, a young man who was uh, 20 years old at the time lost his life where this could have been avoided. The driver who uh, killed Mr. Shaw was on a, uh, uh, he had to take a breath test just to activate his vehicle. And he, he often failed that. There was a few instances where he didn't even pass that. Uh, the, the, one of that driver's convictions for drunk driving um, that was back in 2010, the blood alcohol level was 0.24, which is three times the legal limit. So again, the, we're talking about situations where the facts really are, are egregious and jump off the page at you that a circumstance like this could have been avoided. And uh, tragically, uh, these are the results of what happened. So I think this is what this does is sends a message that we're going to commit to keeping our roads safe and, and protecting our, our citizens from hazards. And this, this, is a, this bill would do that. And I would hope to set up support it. And I can answer any questions. Thank you very much, Representative Abbas. Is there, uh, are there any questions from the committee? Senator French. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative. So the way I'm reading this is if someone is convicted of aggravated DWI, which is 0.16, and they've been in an act Accident where say they hit a tree and hurt themselves. Once they get out of the hospital, then we can send them to prison for twenty to thirty years. So, so the the, aggra the aggravated provision. There's uh, several circumstances that can actually invoke the aggravated um, drunk driving clause, but the one that would only be invoke it under the enhanced sentencing would be is if there is a accident involves a seriously bodily injury. Uh, it, although it, it could be interpreted to apply to an injury to yourself, it, I, I would say that for the 
in the discretion of the prosecutor. Again, this is something the prosecutor would ask for. It's not necessarily something that the court would, would accept. I would also find that the discretion of, uh, if the injury is simply to yourself, that that is not the intent of this. And that would not, I would say, not be good discretion exercising that to prosecute someone for injuring themselves. So, but could that happen under this, the way as written, it, it could. Thank you. And I would say if a person does get in an accident and they are the only person injured, oh, as sad as that is, that, that's still lucky because no one was killed. Thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions for Representative Abbas? Senator Kahn? You're on mute, Senator Kahn. I got it. <laughs> I looked at 265, thank you. I looked at uh, RSA 265 and 630 and um, so what I'm wondering if you can answer, is there a standard sentencing, minimum sentencing currently for aggravated uh, intoxicated driving? Aggravated so, a a assault as a result of intoxicated driving. Well, th there, my understanding for if it's going to involve the point of a homicide, it's seven it would be seven years. In the, in the case of the with Mr. Shaw, the defendant was got six to 12 years. So there is still a circumstance for enhanced sentences. That, my, to my understanding, would fall under, at this time, it falls under RSA uh, six, 651 colon six, uh, Roman numeral three, uh, subsection A, which actually broadens, and it, it, that's actually in the bill, and you can see with that, we, that would be a minimum, it can be 10 years, but not more than 30 years. So there are circumstances where the person could be elevated much higher than that, but at the same time, I don't, I don't believe it, it's, fall, it's being put into that category. Uh, I think something that the 30 years request is, uh, is too high. So what this does is it focuses on really when you have some of the prior conviction, but that's why in, in the bill, it, it expressly excludes negligent homicide and aggravated driving while intoxicated from Section A. Thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions for Representative Abbas? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Representative. Okay. Uh, next, we have Beth Shaw. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, Ms. Shaw. Um, I'd like to start by offering you uh, the deepest condolences of our committee on the loss of your son. Um, thank, okay. thank you very much. Okay. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for allowing me to speak on Bill 179. Um, I support Bill 179, which would be known as Tyler Shaw's Law. Tyler Shaw, as you know, is my son. Tyler was 20 years old when he was killed by a drunk driver in April of 2018. Sadly, the tragic crash that killed my son would mark the third drunk driving conviction of that man. I ask you to consider this question. If your son, daughter, spouse or parent were senselessly, brutally murdered by a person whose drunk driving record is littered with drunk driving convictions, would you feel six years in prison is an adequate penalty for the death of your loved one? It is important for you to know the history of the drunk driver, Joseph Leonard Jr., who killed Tyler. It is the backbone of this bill Mr. Leonard's first drunk driving conviction was at the age of 17. His second drunk driving conviction involved a single car accident with a blood alcohol of 0.24 and an admission that he also took countless prescription pills before getting behind the wheel. He was sentenced to 12 months in prison, all of which were suspended by a New Hampshire judge. He was required to have an interlock installed in his car. Five months after the interlock was installed, he blew a 0.16 into his interlock. 
In November of 2017, his interlock was removed from his vehicle. A mere six months later, he killed my son. Mr. Leonard was not coming from a bar the night he killed Tyler. He was coming directly from work in Lebanon. His home was in Derry. He knew he had a two hour drive ahead of him and yet he chose to drink enough during his work day to put his blood alcohol at 0.16 at the time of the crash. His history of drinking and driving endangering countless lives of New Hampshire residents is horrifying. What I find equally horrifying is the missed opportunities by New Hampshire court to hold Mr. Leonard accountable for driving drunk with each conviction. After all, the goal of sentencing is to send a clear message of deterrence and rehabilitation. However, when New Hampshire courts allow a defense lawyer to successfully plead down charges to a slap on the wrist, that opportunity is lost. I will always wonder if Mr. Leonard had served some time, any time from his second conviction, would it have changed Mr. Leonard's proven commitment to drinking and driving? More importantly for me, would my son be alive today? To reinforce the fact that current negligent homicide penalties are inadequate is to compare them to the penalties of other crimes, none of which resulted in death. In 2019 and 2020, the following sentences were handed down in New Hampshire courtrooms. A Moulton Borough man was sentenced to 15 to 30 years in a teen's rape. A Laconia man was sentenced to five years in prison for robbery. A Manchester man was convicted or sentenced to 16 and a half years in prison for assaulting and robbing someone who was assisting federal agents. A Manchester man was sentenced to 11 years in prison for federal marijuana convictions. A Gosstown man was sentenced to seven and a half years for possession of a controlled drug and possession of a controlled drug with the intent to sell or dispense. A Manchester man was sentenced to 10 years for possessing a firearm after a prior felony conviction. As terrible as those crimes are, None of those crimes resulted in a death, yet the sentences are longer than that of negligent homicide. Negligent homicide, quite simply, is murder. There has been some criticism of this bill that an enhanced sentence is not going to deter people from driving drunk or solve the underlying problem. That is not the purpose behind Bill 179. The purpose is to adequately and appropriately sentence habitual offenders who take the life of an innocent victim. A drunk driver with multiple convictions undoubtedly deserves the enhancements articulated in this bill. As a mother who has made her way through the criminal justice system because her young son was killed by a habitual drunk driver, I am urging you to support this bill help protect New Hampshire residents and honor those lives who were senselessly taken by a habitual drunk driver. As a state, New Hampshire needs to step up and strengthen the drunk driving laws. Too many innocent victims are dying on New Hampshire roads. You won't see change unless you make change. If this bill could save just one life, wouldn't it be worth it? I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Shaw. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none. Thank you for your testimony this afternoon. Thank you. Margaret, I don't have anyone else who has signed up to speak. Is there anyone in the waiting room? If anybody else wishes to testify, if you could virtually raise your hand. I do not see any hands. Okay, um, I am going to go ahead and close uh, House Bill 179 with the note that uh, 36 people had called in support of the bill and one person opposed it. Okay, we are a little behind here. So I am going to go ahead and open the next public hearing on House Bill 347 and call the prime sponsor, Representative Abbas.
Good afternoon again, Madam Chair, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, Representative Daryl Abbas. I represent the people of Rockingham County, District 8. And I'm the prime sponsor of uh, House Bill 347. Uh, this bill was uh, passed on consent uh, last term on the Transportation House Transportation Committee, but uh, was tabled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I uh, didn't have as much love this year in the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee, but it did pass a positive recommendation and it's now before uh, passing the House. I, it, I believe it did pass on a voice vote. Uh, what this bill does, is essentially for any person who is who's convicted of driving with a suspended license, uh, the, in the state of New Hampshire, it only takes into consideration uh, in-state convictions. Uh, I came When I came across this, I initially thought it might have been a drafting error. Uh, where many driving offenses, uh, such as drunk driving, would they take into consideration out-of-state convictions. But for whatever reason, when you're driving with a suspended license uh, only factors in in-state convictions. The idea is, uh, the thought was that a long time ago, it was much harder to prove a prior conviction because often you need to get a certified copy of the prior conviction. Not everything was uh, digital or online. Now with, with driving records being digital and online, it's, it's relatively uh, an easy task uh, to, get, to get that information to prove the prior conviction. So, and what, what we, we see, especially in the Southern part of the state, and I, this was something that was brought up to me by a police prosecutor that uh, there's a lot of arrests made for people driving with the suspended license uh, who reside out of state, but they're driving in New Hampshire with with a suspended license. And again, it's, we are, the state right now is unable to take into consideration the prior conviction. Uh, and, and my experience of practicing law, which is over a decade, it's very rare that a charge like this is a standalone charge. It's often a uh, trail to either reckless driving or drunk driving or some, there's some type of other offense that often attaches to it. So for someone to have a conviction like uh, on their record, it was either in all likelihood, a trailer. I know I'm making a presumption. All likelihood, a trailer charge, or it was, um, it was through multiple offenses. So it's if if it is a standal, quite often, in my experience, uh, county attorneys or, or prosecutors are willing to dismiss the, the charge, provided the license has been reinstated. So situations where a person, their license expired by a day or two, and they, for whatever reason, or they didn't pay a, a, a speeding ticket. And that resulted in the license suspension. That's usually a very uh, simple process to reinstate your license. But this has to do when you have multiple occasions with multiple convictions. But if they're all over the, they're not in New Hampshire, if they're not being charged uh, as subsequent offenses. So this would, uh, I would say, fix either A, a drafting error, or at least update the law consistent with other draft laws. And I can answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony, Representative. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, next, we're going to go to Richard Head. Um, good afternoon, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Richard Head. I'm the Government Affairs Coordinator for the Judicial Branch. Um, we do not take a position on the policy of the bill, but we are asking for an amendment to the effective date. I know you all have heard me talk about this before, some as early as a couple hours ago, um, but the, there is a statute that governs effective date on bills, RSA 14 colon 9 dash A, that says each law affecting judicial practice and procedure or establishing or eliminating criminal prohibitions or civil causes of action be, uh, should become effective no sooner than January 1, 2022. Um, and that's because we go through, uh, after all of the bills have come through, the governor assigned them to modify the uniform charge table, um, modify the Odyssey database that we have in the court system. And the uniform charge table is used within the J-1 program for all state, local uh, prosecutors and police, uh, and also state agencies involved in law enforcement uh, to ensure that we have a standardized method of, of um, identifying crimes. And it's a very detailed uh, chart. So for example, this is a relatively simple bill, but it contains three elements that have to be changed within the chart, that being the description, the misdemeanor and uh, the fine and the penalty assessment. Um, 
and it takes a great deal of time to get through all of them. So the statute that is in effect that would require a, an effective date of January 1, 2022 would apply to this. So we are asking for uh, uh, an amendment to the bill that would change the effective date to January 1. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions for the committee? Senator Kahn. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. It seems we've got somebody who has some experience maybe with these cases. Um, seven years seems like a long time uh, to, to look back on a record. Uh, and maybe you've got some guidance for us uh, as to, uh, you know, is that, is that reasonable? Does it, uh, compare with other statutes and other sentencing that uh, and look back periods for other things. Um, so I apologize. I don't know the answer. We did not and do not take a position on the on the policy. The seven years, at least on the bill version I'm looking at is existing language. Um, and the only the addition is looking at it in other jurisdictions. Um, I don't know sort of the frequency with which that seven year period is used. And I don't think the way our data is, is stored, we would be able to drill down to that level of detail to get it to whether or not, you know, these were look backs to seven years or less than seven years. Um, but that is, but I don't know sort of the comparison to other jurisdictions uh, as to, as to the look back. Thanks for, thanks for trying to, Address the question. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't have an answer. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Head? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Head. Great, thank you. Next, we're going to go to Catherine Cooper. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Catherine Cooper. I'm here today testifying on behalf of the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and we oppose the first part of this bill. Um, essentially, the first part of this bill elevates what I would consider to be a garden variety violation level operating after suspension charge that's based on an administrative suspension from a violation to a misdemeanor. This applies to first offenses, and we oppose this because we don't believe that this will do anything to deter people from their need to drive. Um, this will also be expensive to the state because the prosecutors will now have the ability if this passes to charge this as an A misdemeanor, which triggers potential for jail time, right to state funded attorney, right to a jury trial, all of which are very expensive to taxpayers. And I'm sure that you are all aware that we are in a major crisis right now with trying to find counsel for all the people in the state who have received criminal charges over the last year. Um, and the court system is having a massively hard time trying to funnel people through this system to get things back running. So this is a really um, unnecessary uh, elevation of a charge and um, it's going to be expensive and frankly will not likely have any impact on people um, deterring them from driving. I, I would like to point out that the state wins their ALS hearings in New Hampshire 93% of the time, but there's also a, sub a substantial delay between when the person has the hearing and when the, de the decision is provided. So, and, and it's important for you to know that the ALS suspension goes into effect before you get a hearing. It's not like in the criminal system where if you're out on bail and you are gonna have a trial, you get to have your trial before you're convicted. The ALS suspensions start before you get your hearing. And I'd like to give you an example of why um, this could be potentially unfair. If a person gets arrested and then for, for something like a, you know, a DUI charge, they're arrested and they either refuse the test or they blow over a 0.08, they would then request an ALS hearing after their arrest the ALS suspension goes into effect 30 days after the arrest. The ALS hearing would be scheduled 35 days after the arrest. The ALS decision usually takes 15 days to be, um, 
you know, provided after the hearing. So that's 20 days after the suspension has already taken effect. So even if that person wins their ALS, the built-in delays in the system have already put them under suspension and they have no recourse. They can't get their license back, even though they are, could be factually and legally innocent. So those people should not be looking at jail time or a criminal conviction. So we would request that you ITL this bill. It's gonna be expensive and it's unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon, Ms. Cooper. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, next, we are going to go to John Simmons. Simons? John, if you could virtually raise your hand. I do not see John. Okay, um, can you check, uh, Margaret, if there's anyone in the waiting room who would like to speak to this if, bill? If anybody else wishes to testify, if you could virtually raise your hand now. I do not see any hand, Senator. Okay, um, we're, we will go ahead and close the hearing on House Bill 347. Uh, next, we are going to, we are five minutes behind. We're going to go ahead and open the public hearing on House Bill 129 and recognize the prime sponsor, Representative Testerman. What was the last name, Senator? Testerman. Representative Testerman, if you could virtually raise your hand. I see Representative Horrigan raising their hand, so maybe they are on there. Okay. Um, I was planning to speak against the bill, so um, I probably wouldn't be yeah, the right I, person to introduce it, so I'll, yeah. I'll wait my turn. Okay, I apologize thank you. for not signing up in advance. But. Okay, um, seeing that there is uh, no one who has asked to speak um, and uh, Representative Testerman is not here. I will go ahead and introduce the bill for the record. So um, people who wish to speak on this bill has an opportunity to do so. Um, good afternoon, um, Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, I am introducing House Bill 129 FN. Uh, for the record, my name is Sharon Carson. I, am, I represent Senate District 14, comprising the towns of Londonderry, Hudson, and Auburn. And I have for your consideration House Bill 129 FN, which seeks to prohibit a person from without consent installing or activating an application on an electronic device that can track an individual's proximity to similar equipment or otherwise relay the individual's location information. Um, I will be taking no questions. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, We had uh, Representative Horrigan, uh, he's the only representative that, and I don't even have his name here signed up to speak. So why don't we uh, put through Representative Horrigan and see what he has to say. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, here I am. So I, I didn't realize, I didn't realize Representative Testerman, uh, nobody was going to show up to testify in favor of the bill. Um, bill deals with similar subject matter as a bill in um, Senate uh, Commerce, and I see two members of the Senate Commerce Committee are here. Reminds me of when I was a freshman once, and I went to uh, one Senate committee in the morning, and then the same five people were sitting around the table in different order in the afternoon, a different committee. It's almost like that. But anyway, this bill, I mean, understand understand the concern about it, online privacy, especially if location data is a uh, is something that people are very concerned about. It's also uh, the basis, of course, it's also the basis of the business model of like all sorts of apps on the internet. In fact, pretty much that's one of the fundamental things the internet is buying and selling, you know, using personal data to uh, provide uh, services to the user and then actually sometimes to third parties. And it's, uh, I don't think uh, this bill that we came here for breaks like a lot of uh, breaks a lot of popular apps. First of all, any type of crowdsourcing app like 
Google Maps or Waze, which tracks where people are going. And um, also it breaks, um, and uh, not that I've needed to use this for several years, but any like dating apps, which, uh, and which uh, rely on, uh, which rely on the software, like giving you the, giving you a little bit of information about other users of the same software in your vicinity. So I think the way this is written would break just a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of apps, some of which are like, well, maybe the dating apps aren't as essential, but certainly the, the mapping apps and a lot of the crowdsourcing uh, apps um, are very are very essential, and they're uh, you know they're mostly provided provided for free by the companies, and I know they're not doing all the goodness and hard to making money off of us in other ways, but still we find them very useful. Um, I don't know, probably none of you read the uh, read the. Uh, Committee report, I rarely read your committee reports, even though they're excellent when I do read them on the Senate side. So I'm sure the same is true of mine, but there was like a, also just what uh, a very misleading claim, which based on COVID-19 tracking software, they were claiming that COVID-19 tracking software is uh, being installed without users' uh, consent. That would be a pretty big story if it was true, even though that's probably a better reason for installing software without people's permission than most other things might lead to that. But uh, that apparently is not true at all. There are a number of states have not, do have voluntary COVID apps you can install. I don't think New Hampshire has one, but I, I seem to have the Massachusetts and Nevada apps on there. But those are uh, those are entire, entirely voluntary. So both the, so your information doesn't get shared unless you actually uh, install the app and opt into it. And the other your contacts uh, also have to uh, opt into it and also like. Uh, also, like they have to have their Bluetooth turned on, which many uh, cell phone users don't necessarily have turned all the time. Finally, uh, there's a lot of privacy protections built into uh, built in all the apps and the operating systems. Um, and uh, I think the uh, the member wrote the uh, wrote the minority report. Unfortunately, here, but she made a very interesting, very excellent point that. Uh, People should take personal responsibility for their devices, so we are able to manage those devices. And you know, sometimes we have to make a lot of compromises, and/or we don't keep up with things. But it's our responsibility to uh, use use those devices uh, devices safely, which includes uh, setting the privacy settings for whatever you feel comfortable setting them to. So uh, that's, uh, I mean, I, it's a well-intentioned bill, but this is uh, probably something that uh, should not be. It's, this is probably something that should not be added to the uh, New Hampshire Hampshire law books, um, and and so that's uh, that was why I was opposed to it. So I didn't realize I was going to be the very first person to speak speak against it. I figured there'd be at least one or more members uh, speaking in favor of it when I raised my hand, and um, I would have signed up in advance, except we had a Senate Judiciary a House Judiciary meeting, which I thought was going to run all day, but uh, Reverend Gordon got us done by lunchtime, so he. Um, Thanks. So that, that, that's, that's what I have to say. I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody feels like asking me. The, the dogs see a squirrel outside and they're going crazy. Um, okay. Thank you very so, much for your testimony, Representative Morgan. Um, Senator Kahn has a question. Sure. Just to get uh, you know, a little bit more information on our record. Uh, did, did you receive additional information from transportation or communication companies that uh, uh, use tracking uh, for uh, business purposes? Okay, well, I'll uh, actually, I'll put, I'll put it that way. We, we have each SB, I, we did get, um, we have gotten a lot of information on other bills. I, I was, this particular one for the House of Criminal Justice, so I'm not on uh, not on that committee. We did, I mean, we think we did get some communications before the bill went to the floor, and it was uh, somewhat controversial and passed by a fairly narrow margin, which is uh, mayor. It was a division vote, so we don't know exactly who voted how, but it was it was similar to the uh, actually the partisan breakdown of the people who were there that day. Although I'm sure some people probably crossed, there's probably some crossover between the two parties on the sides of it. So uh, I mean, I've so I've heard about the tech industry and transportation about other similar bills. I can't remember whether they've reached out to me on uh, any of these thanks, bills. Thanks for that's trying. To, thank yeah, that's probably a longer it. answer than you needed. But. Hey, thank you. Thank I didn't realize that. Thanks.
Vice Chair. Looks like the okay. squirrels, the squirrels are still at it. There we go. Uh, thank you, Representative Horgan. Good to see you again. Oh, good oh, to see Aaron's you. Back. I'm oh, back. Sorry. sorry, I had to. It's not a problem. They were, they were just going nuts over a squirrel, so I had to let them out. But I had to give the squirrel an advanced time to get out, to, <laughs> so they could get away. Um, thank you very much for your testimony, Representative. Um, next, we are going to go to. Um, Let's see, who else do we have here? Um, let's go to Brian Strong. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, my name is Brian Strong and I'm a Lieutenant with the New Hampshire State Police. I'm the commander of our Special Investigations Unit. And in reading this uh, proposed bill, I, I see the lack of uh, like a law enforcement caveat or an exception. And I believe just the broad nature of the bill may cause court orders allowing GPS trackers or vehicles, on, excuse me, on vehicles or the activation of a vehicle's GPS system to locate a driver to lo no longer be tools that law enforcement can utilize uh, as it's written. Um, and I think that uh, if this is to go forward, there should be some consideration for a law enforcement exception. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions, Senator Gannon? Um, thank you, Mr. Strong. With the exception that we had in commerce this morning, like word for word, can we just lift that and put it in here? Would that meet your what you're looking for? Uh, yes, sir. I think that might have been on uh, one of the bills earlier that I sat on. And yes, that's it was referring to. I think that would uh, that would meet this criteria. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions from uh, Trooper Strong? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much. Um, next, we are going to go to um, Paula Minahan. Paula, you should be able to unmute. Good afternoon, um, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Um, for the record, my name is Paula Minahan, Senior Vice President, State Government Relations with the New Hampshire Hospital Association, representing all our hospitals in the state. We are concerned with the proposed language in House Bill 129. Um, while the hospitals obtain consent before placing an electronic device on a person, the proposed language would cause issues in cases where medical devices could be considered one of the devices described in the bill. And for an example, a weighted um, detecting device could be used on a hospital bed to alert healthcare personnel if the patient falls out of the bed. And then um, the central monitoring station that's kind of referenced in the bill could be a nurse's station to monitor those devices. Um, and this bill as written would prohibit such a monitoring station from the way we're reading it. Um, while that may not have been the intent of the sponsor, this bill um, of the bill to apply to healthcare facilities, um, our read is that it does impact them as drafted. So if this bill were to move forward, we would ask that you consider amending the bill to ensure that hospitals and other healthcare facilities that utilize devices such as I described and equipment for safety of the patient are not negatively impacted. Um, and one, one idea is to just explicitly exempt healthcare facilities and providers from this bill. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Minahan. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, Lisa McKay. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa McCabe and I'm here on behalf of CTIA, the Trade Association for the Wireless Communications Industry in opposition to House Bill 129. 
This bill would add to further fragmentation of consumer privacy laws and raises particular concerns because it's technology and sector specific. Consumer privacy protections should apply consistently across all industry sectors and protection should be consistent for any given type of information. This bill only applies to one type of information, location information that's used on an application on an electronic vice, device for tracking and sharing location information. This is something consumers are unlikely to expect or understand. This bill would have unintended consequences. For example, the bill could capture uses that are reasonable, such as a company that uses a device on their packages to track the package for legitimate purposes. For example, tracking produce or fish to make sure it remains safe to eat upon delivery. This bill could also impede an employer's legitimate need to track fleet vehicles for business purposes. Privacy issues are better addressed with a holistic approach that does not favor one business model over another in order to lessen any unintended consequences and provide consistent consumer protections. For these reasons, CTIA respectfully requests that you report this bill inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon, Ms. McCabe. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next, we're going to go to Maura Weston. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, for the record, my name is Maura Weston. I'm testifying today on behalf of the New England Cable and Telecommunications Association. <clears throat> NECTA is a five state regional trade association representing substantially all private cable telecommunications companies in New Hampshire. Our members include. Um, I should modify the cable telecommunication companies, I want to be clear, uh, that includes uh, Atlantic Broadband, Charter, and Comcast. Um, these companies are some of New Hampshire's leading broadband and communications providers with over 450,000 uh, customers in more than 184 communities. I'm here today in opposition to House Bill 129. Although we appreciate uh, the intent of the legislation is overly broad and its application would have unintended consequences, unlegitimate business practices in a variety of industries. Without clarifying language, this legislation would criminalize common applications and software used in virtually all modern devices while impeding companies' abilities to use these technologies for services that are critical to executing legitimate functions core to business operations. <clears throat> for example, um, and a, one, one example is a badge access system, which businesses utilize for security purposes to enter and exit facilities and to manage internal access within those facilities. Badge systems can also be used for routine everyday business functions, such as using copiers and printers or access to product or inventory storage. Requiring that an employer make these types of uses optional <clears throat> by suggesting that consent can be withdrawn or withheld is not only inappropriate, but it could pose safety and security threats uh, in business operations and to employees. Another use um, that would be prohibited under this legislation, as Ms. McCabe mentioned, is fleet vehicle uh, management. <clears throat> this is particularly concerning to our industry as we own and operate the largest fleet, uh, largest vehicle fleets in the state. Fleet management software monitors everything from engine idle time to lower emissions to vehicle location for efficient routing and time management. The efficient operation and maintenance of the state's most capable broadband networks, serving more than those 450, 100,000 homes and businesses, is made possible in part through fleet analytics collected by hardware and software that would ultimately be prohibited by this bill without consent. <clears throat> Location data related applications are also very important to, cust to customer experience in our industry. In the cable industry, for example, um, Comcast, for example, offers a tool on their customer app, which allows customers um, to understand or know where the Comcast technician uh, is if they're nearby the home and the app will send a picture so you know how to recognize your technician. This is important for convenience and frankly, safety. Um, it gives the, co the consumer a lot more visibility into the process. <clears throat> of 
Overall, we believe that our technologies allow for enhanced consumer experience and greater efficiency. All modern day advances that consumers have grown to expect from companies providing customer service like the companies Nectar represents. Um, lastly, HB 129 is problematic because the, prohib the prohibition applies even on a person's own property. So as drafted, Nectar member companies would be prohibited from placing tracking and monitoring technology on their own vehicles or their own equipment in their own buildings without consent. So that summarizes our position on the bill. Uh, because of these points, we respectfully ask that you not advance HB 129, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Weston. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. And uh, I will now call on uh, Chief Goldstein. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good Remember, afternoon, Chief. Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is David Goldstein. I'm presently the Chief of Police in the city of Franklin. I've been a police officer for 41 years. I'm also the Legislative Chair for the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police. And I'm here to uh, testify in opposition to HB 129 as written. And I believe that Lieutenant Strong probably did most of my work for me earlier. Uh, Senator Gannon, you're correct. We, uh, we, made, we are looking at the uh, language from HB 384 and trying to transpose that over to this bill. I've had texting conversation with the prime sponsor and my impression is that he is not, uh, he does not object to the amendments that we'd like to put in relative to exceptions, not only for law enforcement, for other emergency services as well. And with that, I'll close any testimony I have and answer any questions that the committee might have. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Are there, Margaret, are there any folks in the waiting room who would like to testify? If anybody else wishes to testify, you can virtually raise your hand. I do not see any hands, Senator Carson. Okay, thank you very much, Margaret. Um, we're gonna go ahead and close the public hearing on House Bill 129. Jenny, are we still, are we still behind time-wise? Okay. Yeah, we're about 10 minutes behind, so we're good to go ahead with the next okay, bill. Okay, so we're good to go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, I am going to open the public hearing on House Bill 125 and recognize the prime sponsor, Representative Klein Knight. Representative Klein Knight, if you could virtually raise your hand. I do not see Representative Klein Knight. Okay, I, um, let's see. I do have a representative Bouchard who has signed up to speak. Is he available? Yes. Okay, um, Representative Bouchard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson and fellow members of the Senate Judiciary Committee for taking my testimony in support of House Bill 100. Representative, excuse me. Um, yes. Representative Klein Knight is not um, available. Can you introduce the bill? Are you um, able to do that? I, I can, I'm not prepared to do that, but I'm prepared to speak in support of the bill. Okay, so do me a favor and just hold on. I will go ahead and introduce the bill, okay? okay thank you. So thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Sharon Carson and I have the pleasure of representing Senate District 14. Uh, comprising the towns of Londonderry, Hudson and Auburn. And I have for your consideration today, um, House Bill 125. And this bill seeks to prohibit law enforcement from distributing post arrest photos of suspects, except in certain circumstances. And I will conclude my testimony and I will now recognize Representative Bouchard. Well, thank you, Madam Chairperson and fellow members of the Senate Judiciary Committee for taking my testimony in support of House Bill 125. Uh, 
and Representative Donald Bouchard from Manchester. One of the most sacred rights in the American criminal justice system is that we are all innocent until proven guilty. In other words, the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt each essential element of the crime charged. Today, police departments in New Hampshire are increasingly using Facebook to inform the community about who they are arresting. Some add a little humor to the mix, but for those of us who are concerned about the rights of the innocent, say posting mugshots and written pejorative descriptions of suspects amounts to public shaming of people who are not yet been convicted of anything. House Bill 125 supports the preponderance of authority as well as supporting the view that there is an independent right called the right of privacy, the invasion of which gives rise to a cause of action. There's another problem with New Hampshire police departments posting mugshots of people not yet convicted. The problem is there is a danger that the showing of a police photograph of a person accused of a crime who is subsequently acquitted may lay the groundwork for an action for damages in which the chief of police could be named as one of the defendants. In such a case, the possible cause of action would be based on an invasion of the right of privacy. The right of privacy is the right of an individual to be left alone, to live a life of seclusion if they choose, or to be free from unwarranted publicity. When we have a question involved in how we balance the individual's right of privacy against the legitimate public interest in the dissemination of information, the balance should always tilt toward the person who has not yet been convicted. I urge you to support House Bill 125. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, and thank you as well, fellow members of the Senate Judiciary Committee for taking my testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony, Representative Bouchard. Um, Senator Gannon has a question. Thank you, Representative, yeah. for taking my question. Um, and it may be off track because I'm just thinking of it now, but would you say then you're worried about privacy interests, what we're seeing all these horrific shootings lately, sometimes maybe the officer's innocent, sometimes he may be guilty. Is he have a privacy interest also to the police in those situations or have they forfeited that by being police? Just curious about your opinion on that. But thank you very much for your question. And that's a tough question to answer. Um, because of the fact that yes, everybody should be considered innocent until proven guilty. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any further questions? Senator Kahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna clarify that this bill is dealing with a post arrest photo distribution, right? That's correct. Okay. So, uh, not inhibiting the search for suspects. That's your understanding, right? No, I, that's my understanding of the bill. Thank you. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Senator Carson. Yes. Um, we have Representative Abbas who has their hand raised. Okay, let's put Representative Abbas through. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the uh, Senate Ju Judiciary Committee. Uh, my name is Daryl Abbas. Uh, I'm a representative from Rockingham County District 8. I was still on the line listening, and, and this bill did come through the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee. I supported it last term, at least a similar bill last term, and I was happy to support it again. And just to, to explain, the, the post-arrest photo uh, distribution was only invoked what up into the point of conviction. If, if someone is convicted of the charges brought against them, then that, that post-arrest photo could be distributed. Uh, the reason why I support this bill, and it's a childhood friend of mine who I you know, went to elementary school with, 
um, about 12 years ago, was charged, uh, arrested and charged with sexual assault, a very serious charge. And the reason he was arrested uh, was that there was a few suspects that were at least being accused, but he was unwilling to submit to a DNA test, which um, I, a lot of criminal defense attorneys would give such advice. So he was arrested because he did not submit to that test. Once he was arrested, the DNA test was performed and he was uh, completely exonerated. The unfortunate consequence of that is that his post-arrest photo was on the front page of the Eagle Tribune. Uh, I will say that the photo did not do him any favors. Uh, he wasn't dressed in a suit or anything. When he, it, it did not look good. And to this day, if you Google his name, that is number one. Number two, what comes up is the photo in the article. And uh, I just know how much difficult it is him for him to maintain a relationship. I mean, he meets someone. Uh, I know either whoever he meets, either the, the, the girl or her parents, whoever Googles his name, someone shows that person this article. Uh, that person did not have uh, substance abuse issues then, and they do now. And this is someone that I've known uh, almost my entire life and uh, someone who, I, you know, I'm still happy to be proud to call him a friend, but at the same time, he does have a lot of personal problems. But yeah, I don't know what the public interest was of having his photograph in the, in the, in the newspaper. I, I appreciate the right to know. And I appreciate the public access to information. The article itself and the information, uh, you know, certain, you know, the, what's said in the police report or the com criminal complaint, that's, that's, can be, that's public record, but the, the photograph just being there, it, it really doesn't, I won't, I won't provide his name. I, you know, for, he's gone through enough, but that's something to keep in mind that uh, I'm not sure what public interest is satisfied. With. I can answer any questions if, if you'd like. Thank you very much for your testimony, Representative. Are there any questions from the committee? I'm seeing none. Thank you again, Representative. Um, next, we're going to call Alan, uh, Chief Alan Aldenberg. Good afternoon, Senator. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we sure can. Good afternoon, Senator Carson and members of the committee. My name is Alan Aldenberg. I'm currently the Chief of Police for the City of Manchester, and I've been in law enforcement for 24 years. I'm here today to testify in opposition to House Bill 125 on behalf of my department and also the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police. Police reports are public records and the public has a right to access them. Classifying post-arrest photos as, and I quote, compiled for investigatory purposes, unquote, and not subject to RSA 91A goes against New Hampshire law enforcement's efforts of being as transparent as possible and will hinder the public's access to the criminal justice system. I understand the sponsors of this bill are concerned about the public scrutiny that is placed upon those that have their arrest photo released, but that does not outweigh the rights of the public and the media access to the information. Law enforcement does not control, or, or nor will we ever control, the right of people to comment on arrest photos or arrest reports. The need for transparency in law enforcement is paramount, particularly in today's climate, and passing this bill will run contrary to that. This, this bill would violate victims' rights, violate the public's right to access government records, to make our communities vulnerable. In closing, I ask you find this bill inexpedient to legislate. I'm available for questions. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much for your testimony, Chief. Um, I believe Senator French has a question for you. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief. Could you tell me how long uh, has been a policy of police departments to release uh, mug shots? My experience, um, having been with this police department for close to 20 years, I would say it's been going on, best guess, in the last um, 10 years, I'd say, 10 to 15 years. I think it's becoming more prevalent now, given social media and, and the many different outlets that request the information, you know, whether it's Facebook or other media outlets. So it's definitely more prevalent now, I'll admit that. Follow-up? Well, uh, thank you. And so... <clears throat> Would you, would you agree that once an image is placed on the internet that it never, ever goes away? I would. I mean, once it's out there, it's out there. That's a fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Chief, um, I have a question for you. Um, we're talking about post-arrest photo distribution by law enforcement officers, but there's nothing in this legislation that stops someone who is a member of the media um, from videotaping or taking any photos 
putting them anywhere on social media or other members of the public. Am I correct in that? That's how I understand it. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the media could go to um, an arraignment and they could obtain the photograph that way. Um, so there's this, yes, there's other, to answer your question, there's other means to obtain the photograph. That would be a fair. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the Chief? Senator Kahn has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief, for being here again. Uh, <clears throat> so there are a lot of <clears throat> very specific instances referred to here where the release of the photo is, <clears throat> is uh, way, it, it, there's a waiver, there's no prohibition uh, to the release. And they, they seem like reasonable conditions that have been established. So I guess I'm, I'm left with, I, I understand that having no prohibitions uh, is maximum flexibility, but I also understand the sponsor's uh, desire to limit the exposure of somebody given the status of uh, social media uh, exposure today. So are there, are there instances where you see this uh, inhibiting your law enforcement, your investigative work? I mean, there are, there are times, Senator, when um, we release photograph, uh, post-arrest photos of people that may be charged with uh, crimes against children. And it does um, solicit or cause other victims to come forward once we release that photo. Um, so there are some, definitely some investigatory um, advantages to photos being released. But I can tell you from like speaking from Manchester alone, um, it's no secret. I mean, I have many arrests on any given day and we, we take, you know, we do our due diligence before we just arbitrarily, we don't arbitrarily release photos. I mean, we, we give it great thought. We give it a lot of consideration before doing so. And we're sensitive to the things that uh, Representative Ava said. Um, that's yeah, I'll admit that's concerning to me and that's unfair to that gentleman. Um, so we're just trying to strike a balance. Um, you know, maybe we can come to some compromise, but I just, I worry about, you know, if we put these measures in place, um, we're putting more requirements on the law enforcement agencies to, you know, dive into these things more spend a lot of time on do we release don't do we don't release um we just we're making it i think harder than it needs to be in my opinion so may i follow up <clears throat> so if you got a 91a request on release of a photo how do you handle that today uh that goes through my legal division i'm fortunate to have one um and if it meets the requirements of 91A, then we go ahead and release. Um, but well, my department gets uh, inundated with 91As already. Um, and th this, this may uh, cause me to get inundated with even more. Um, may I follow? Yes, follow up again. Uh, Madam Chair, I mean, sorry, Chief. Um, <clears throat> um, but the first line of this bill is that uh, it actually alleviate some of that uh, pressure uh, by excluding this from 91A. Yes, I apologize. You're right. I apologize. It, sorry. It, Chief, I, I, I find myself, I, 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 I think you, you usually provide us with pretty good guidance. Uh, and this one, I, I just feel that uh, if, we, if we look at the bill in its details, uh, it, it really still provides the law enforcement community with the opportunity to share when necessary uh, photos uh, post arrest. And the only thing I see here that, that I, I guess I was wondering about yet is if the, the additional burden seems to be the uh, maintenance of a record of when it was released uh, and you know, is that, 
Is that that onerous a, a requirement? It could be, um, especially for the number of uh, the volume of arrests that it has here. Uh, may not be so difficult for small departments, but um, you know, it's an added task. But you know, if this bill goes through, then you know, we'll learn to adapt and we'll live with it. We'll figure it out. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. Next, we're going to go to uh, Brian Strong. Good, Adam, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Good afternoon. I, again, my name is Brian Strong. I'm a lieutenant with New Hampshire State Police in charge of the Special Investigations Unit. And uh, I just have um, a couple things to, uh, to add. Um, in reading it, it uh, looks like there is currently only an allowance in this bill to circulate a photo of a wanted person for a crime that possesses an immediate or ongoing threat to public safety. Uh, it appears to preclude circulating a photo to the public of a person wanted for offenses such as serial vehicle thefts. Uh, in that prior example, if the vehicles were taken from a given area, it makes sense to be able to circulate a booking photo to the public. I think it would be, it would, um, excuse me, I think you would have to stretch it to say that a vehicle theft, a theft is a threat to public safety, and therefore this bill would make circulating the photo illegal. Uh, the same can be said for individuals who are wanted for license fraud. It seems as though we would lose the ability to disseminate the photos of wanted individuals to DMV clerks. This is critically important because an individual may not always be presenting the same identifying documents, for example, like uh, fraudulent or stolen identities. Um, so maybe perhaps uh, ongoing threat to public safety uh, could be defined um, more in this bill if that's the way that this bill is going to um, with only allowing it for the ongoing threat of public safety because the offenses that I just listed would be a stretch probably to fit that criteria. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Lieutenant Strong, are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I'd just point to line nine, uh, officer. If you could, you know, or is suspected of committing a subsequent crime while on bail, uh, does that cover the instance that you were just referring to as serial auto theft? One moment, Senator. I'm trying to find the, the area. I apologize. I believe that possibly could, could fit it, uh, Senator. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Lieutenant Strong? Lieutenant Strong, I, I have a, hopefully what is a quick question. I'm looking at the same section that my colleague, Senator Kahn uh, asked you about. But what I'm concerned is the language that says that you can publish the pictures related to a crime for which the subject has not been convicted, if the subject fails to appear before the court after having been granted bail or is suspected of committing a subsequent crime while on bail and the assistance of the public is necessary to locate the subject after routine non-public methods of locations have been exhausted. Can you talk a little bit about what are the, um, what, what do you do when somebody does this? What, non-public methods that you would have to exhaust. I would imagine if somebody who has been granted bail and has not shown up for court, you wanna catch this person as soon as possible. And that's why their picture would be published or made available to people. Um, how long do, do you think that this legislation would hurt or hinder that process and allowing you to catch that person quicker? 
Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. I believe, uh, I mean, every every situation is going to be different. Some are, are readily known to uh, probably law enforcement and a number of people. However, um, I believe that, uh, you know, for serious offenses that uh, somebody fails to show up and we need to or want to uh, try to locate that person quickly. And if we don't have uh, information, if they're transient, if, uh, you know, they're not living at the, the same place that they're listed um, by putting that photo out, generate um, or could possibly generate um, tips from the public to help us locate that person. So I believe that it would definitely uh, help law enforcement in uh, locating individuals that they're not readily able to locate. I hope that somewhat answered your question, Madam Chair. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions for Lieutenant Strong? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, we're gonna to talk to um, Brendan McQuaid. Hello, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Uh, thank you for accepting my testimony today. My name is Brendan McQuaid. I live in Manchester and I'm currently the president and publisher of the New Hampshire Union Leader. I'm here representing myself as well as the New Hampshire Press Association. The New Hampshire Press Association strongly opposes HB 125 as a threat to government transparency and the ability of the press to hold government accountable. I believe the committee should have received my written testimony. At the top of that testimony, I included a booking photograph. That booking photo shows a man with a swollen eye and a bloodied face. The man blamed off-duty police officers for his injuries and due to the booking photo being public and a matter of public record, the union leader was able to Mr. McQuaid, we're having difficulty hearing you. Senator, should we move on and I can give Mr. McQuaid a call and see if we can get him sorted out? Yeah, why don't we do that? Because I think what he has to say is, is very important to this bill. Okay, um, next we're going to go to Trisha Nualu. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Senate Judiciary Committee and Madam Chair. My name is Trisha Navalu. I am representing myself and my community in support of House Bill 125. I host a weekly virtual peer support group for sex workers in New England. The majority of our members are in New Hampshire. I have heard people in our group speak about the life altering ramifications of what happens when your image is circulated publicly in a defaming nature. Regardless of a person's assumed guilt, law enforcement should not have the power to paint any individual with a digital scarlet letter. The most recent data shows that human trafficking victims accused of prostitution are often unable to secure housing and employment. One of our community members was denied employment due to a post by law enforcement. I ask you to please consider what the future may look like to people in my marginalized community trying to earn a living outside of sex work. Exiting the lifestyle is nearly impossible with a solicitation crime charge along with a photograph that is easily found through any internet browser. To be publicly shamed and judged by the court of social media is an insult to due process. I hope that you support House Bill 125. I'm open for any questions if you have any, and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, Jen, were we able to reestablish a connection with Mr. McQuaid? I wasn't able to get Mr. McQuaid on the phone. Um, obviously, I'm calling on my cell phone, so I'm sure he thinks it's spam. Um, if Mr. McQuaid, we can either try him again on this line or if he wants okay, to. Okay, let's, let's try him again. 
by phone. Okay, let's see if we can try them again. Do you have me now? Yes, we hear you, Mr. I, McQuaid. I apologize, the connection dropped for some reason. Okay, um, well, thank you. So uh, I'm not sure where I left off, but I was uh, saying how it was ironic that the Manchester police um, were speaking in opposition to this bill alongside us and our reason for opposing this bill actually concerns actions by Manchester police officers um, and keeping that kind of information in the public eye. Um, much of the discussion around this bill has concerned the social media posts of police departments. While this bill may have the desired effect of limiting those social media posts, it does so by blasting a massive hole in police accountability. It's the legislative equivalent of killing a fly with an atomic bomb. It may kill the fly, but the collateral damage will be catastrophic. In this case, that collateral damage is to police transparency. The Facebook pages of police departments may be an issue to be addressed, but this bill is not the way to do it. The public has a right to know whom police have arrested. And that includes what those arrestees look like. This bill would not just affect the right of the accused, it would also affect those with the same name as the accused. As an example, I have a cousin also named Brendan McQuaid. He recently opened a pizza restaurant in Manchester. We ran a story on it. We didn't run a photo. I've been asked dozens of times <laughs> if I can get free pizza for people because they know. assume that it's me. Now, lucky for me, my cousin is a restaurateur and not a bank robber. But if it had been the same situation and we ran a picture, you know, we didn't run a picture of a suspected bank robber with the same name, that assumption would have fallen on me. So I think we need to consider all of the factors here and that it is not just the arrested individual's right to privacy that are in effect. Um, my colleague, longtime union leader correspondent Kim Haas, pointed out in her written testimony to you um, that there are several exceptions here, but those are subjective um, exceptions. And it creates subjective tests regarding what constitutes a danger to the public. The experience of journalists is that police departments tend to err on the side of not releasing things. If they have any excuse, they won't release it. Um, that would create a problem where that subjectivity exists. And that's the way the law is currently written. Uh, she also points out that uh, other victims may come forward after seeing a photograph of an arrestee, and that would not happen if this bill went into effect. You all know how important the right to know law is to New Hampshire. RSA 91A is an invaluable tool for the public as well as journalists in keeping the government accountable. I would strongly urge you to kill this bill and not to create any new exceptions to 91A. As my colleague Nancy West pointed out to me this morning, she's from the New Hampshire Center for Public Interest Journalism. It is especially troubling that in a time when the public is demanding more police transparency, that lawmakers would consider taking a major step backwards by requiring police to hide the legal image they use as part of an arrest record. I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon, Mr. McQuaid. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kahn? So I continue to try to peel back on this piece of legislation and for the exceptions that are in place uh, to see if the privacy protection and the exceptions that the bill provides uh, strikes an adequate balance. Uh, and so the, the section, and I, I'm not pulling it up immediately, but the section I recall here is that uh, the victim can give permission to the release of the photograph. Uh, in the case that you were mentioning of the victim of uh, excessive police force, uh, that that would, would that photo have uh, not been released? That depends. I mean, imagine the scenario, right? What we're talking about is police accountability, right? So in a scenario where the police say, 
hey, look, you don't want to release that photo. We'll go ahead and we'll drop all the charges that you have against you. That's a very powerful tool for the police who would want to keep something like that hidden. We were able to get it because it was a matter of public record. It should be a matter of public record. What happens to people who just disappear off of the street? What does that individual look like? What is their name, right? It's unfortunate that that has gotten wrapped up in this whole Facebook social media thing. But what we're talking about is actually what goes on with the government is the public's business and they should know what is happening and you know what is happening to individuals. Who does the government have and why? And that includes a photo of the person. Uh, may, may I just- Yes, uh, follow up, Senator Kahn. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Mr. McQuaid for uh, your testimony today. I think it's helpful to hear from uh, the press and you, you folks certainly, uh, it's an important role that you play. Um, and uh, I, I know I was going to make a point uh, along with uh, thanking you for, for taking the question, but I've lost that. And uh, anyway, thanks for uh, being present today. Getting old, Jay. Getting, getting old, old. <laughs> or tired. Uh, <laughs> uh, been in hearing since nine o'clock. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. McQuaid. Okay, next we're going to go to Joseph Lascaz. Lascaz, if you could virtually raise your hand. I. Don't see Mr. Lascas. I do have two hands raised, so I'm not sure. Okay, um, I have one other person who has signed up to speak, and then we'll go to those other persons. Um, I'll, the next, we will go to Andrew Connolly. And Mr. Connolly, if you could virtually raise your hand. I do not see Mr. Connolly. Okay, then let's go to the folks in the waiting room. Okay, first I will call Tony Shinella. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Tony Shinella. I'm a native of New Hampshire and the local field editor for patch.com with 12 news and community websites covering 13 cities and towns. Our company has more than 1200 sites across the country currently. The there's a, I want to agree with a number of things that Brendan said, and I won't repeat it and limit my comments to a couple of things. Historically, these photos have been released to the public because they have a right to know what people who are arrested and accused of crimes look like. And I, I raised some concerns about the, the concept of adequate um, uh, balance that is noted in the revised bill. Um, when you take away the ability for the police departments to release these booking photos with these types of restrictions, it's just simply not in the public interest. And it also handcuffs our ability to be able to do our jobs in a complete manner. The, the, the danger to the public, and I, and I appreciate what Representative Abbas mentioned, because I know, uh, I know of people who are found completely innocent of crimes, and especially dangerous ones like rape, and, and have been affected by um, the release of photos. Uh, one of the things that we do here at Patch is that when people have been proven innocent, when charges have been dropped, and also uh, when people have done their time and resolve their cases, we not only remove the information, but we also reach out directly to Google uh, to have the names of the, of the people arrested, their charges, as well as their booking photos completely removed from their website, and, uh, from their search engine, excuse me. Um, and that allows and we don't do that for annulments. We do that for, uh, because annulments can be a legal process. It takes time and costs money. We do that when they send me the case summary showing the fine has been paid. Uh, uh, you know, this, this, I served the six months placed on hold without a finding uh, and we remove that information. One of, two other really quick points. The, the danger that this poses to the public is because many of these crimes uh, even with these, with the adequate balance exceptions, 
such as first degree assault, second degree assault, rape, drug dealing, burglary, armed robbery, arson, which is a misdemeanor in most cases in New Hampshire. These, any request by me or any other journalist to get uh, the photo of an armed robber who was just arrested, accused of armed robbery, a person who was accused of armed robbery would not be allowed under this restriction. Other people come forward based often on, uh, on arrests that we write about. Um, I won't get into the constitutionality of this, but I, because again, you as lawmakers have the ability to be able to change what is allowed. But I really think the, 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 the I think it's article 22 that, re, that stresses the liberty of the press. This really hampers what we can choose and choose not to write about and inform our public about. I wanna say one other quick thing um, and this is going to sound like I'm bragging, but I, I, I've had a number of police departments say over the years how much previous stories that we've written have helped them solve crimes. A few years ago, a detective at, a, at my son's, uh, one of my son's birthday parties that he went to, there was a detective there. We got to talking about the website, and he mentioned that 75% of their open cases were solved due to previous reporting that I had done, specifically because a person's mugshot was in the story. So in many ways, whether anybody realizes it or not, media outlet crime reporting assists law enforcement with prevention and community policing. Um, the last part of this too is many of us know that there's a lot of people who don't trust the media and they haven't for a long time, even before the, you know, the internet became, became popular 20 years ago. But on this one, I'm gonna ask you to not limit what police departments can release to us and trust us to know what's in the public interest. This bill makes our jobs a lot more difficult and it determines what our audience should and should not read and see, especially when it comes to transparency of the police departments. And this is not the direction we should be going in. So I'm gonna, I would ask you to, to vote this bill inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. And thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the, uh, the point I was <laughs> gonna make uh, previously was that the, the balancing test continues to, to be a challenge for us between uh, privacy and the public's right to know. So uh, here's, here's one more. But you, you, you said that uh, patch.com, uh, that you've got a policy of removing from your website photographs uh, of uh, post-arrest uh, in instances where the fine's been paid, the sentence been completed, uh, or, or the person's been adjudicated uh, innocent. Um, how do you do that? So it's a very, so we have um, a link on every cop log, or police blotter or, or police story that explains the process. So let's say, um, uh, person X gets arrested and charged with theft. Um, they, they go in, they, they plead guilty. The case is put on hold without a finding for six months. At the end of six months, they can send me a copy of the case summary, which is freely given by the district court, and then email it to me, and I will remove the information from the police blotter. And then we have um, employees at our company, I put in all the information, they contact Google directly, and Google removes the person's name from, the, uh, from their search engine on that charge, on that link. And we do that with, and, and just, I guess I wasn't completely clear. So um, charges that are dropped too. So if a case is a person's arrested and two weeks later, it's the other Brendan McQuaid, that the pizza guy who owns it and, and, and it's not the newspaper publisher, you know, that, that would, the case gets dropped, that would be taken down. Um, I would contact, you know, our employee who then contacts Google and then removes it. So, so it's, um, so charges that have been dropped, uh, charges that our, our person has, is arrested does, and resolves the issue. Um, and even with larger cases that, that, you know, they serve three years, they get out on two years probation, we've taken those down too. So it's everything that is resolved. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Shinella? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Shinella. Thank you, ma'am.
And we have one more person, Margaret? We have two. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you, Gilles. Oh, oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Gilles Bissonnette with the ACLU of New Hampshire. And I'm actually here pinch hitting for uh, Joseph Lescaz, our smart justice organizer. He was hoping to testify here, but had a, an engagement at 2.30. Uh, so I, I've rushed in uh, to, to, uh, to this hearing. Uh, so we support the bill. We supported it in the House uh, in here. And I think I'm in the rare position of being on the opposite side, uh, frankly, of the Press Association and Brandon McQuain, who uh, I respect immensely. We've collaborated on so many other issues. Um, I'll note, too, that I think Joseph will be testifying or submitting some written testimony as well to the committee after, the, after his hearing. And I'm just going to summarize it, if that's OK, um, to, uh, for the committee. Um, Mugshots capture someone at what's often their worst moment, uh, and they're taken at a time when people are presumed innocent, and yet too often there's a stigma of assumed guilt that comes with a mugshot, and this of course can last for years where the person is acquitted or if the charges in total are dismissed, and that's I think really the concern that's motivated this bill, and of course if a person is convicted um, under this bill, of course, the mugshot can ultimately be released. And I think there's a, the feeling is that that satisfies at the end of the day, the public's right to know. And I'll just kind of give one example. I'll deviate a little bit from uh, Joseph's testimony, if it's okay. I'll give one example of how this kind of uh, uh, this issue uh, came into my practice. I had a client who was arrested by a police department for recording the police while outside in a public place. And it was an unconstitutional charge. And uh, his mugshot was released um, and uh, by the department, and it was published in the newspaper the next day. And he was fired the the next day, um, uh, you know, because uh, you know his employer immediately saw the mugshot, knew that 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 was his employee, and um, you know the, it was a very unfortunate situation. And of course, a court ultimately concluded there that his prosecution violated the First Amendment and was dismissed. But he had to to live with that. So I think it's really, that's kind of one of the concerns that's motivating this. And I do want to stress how the bill is narrow. Uh, it only pertains to pre-conviction uh, mugshots. There are multiple exceptions. And it of course doesn't pertain to the underlying files pertaining to that prosecution. You know, of course we believe institutionally at the ACLU that all court records and investigatory files should be public. And that includes even if there's an acquittal and we believe that should also apply in other contexts um, as well, because there the disclosure helps inform the public on the nature of the prosecution, what the allegations are, and how the government is proposing to use its power. And again, this isn't addressing those types of records, which um, uh, really can inform the public as to what's going on. Again, here we're just talking about um, the pre-conviction mugshot. And I would note um, that just at least one other state, New York, has restricted access to similar mugshot information that I think uh, this bill actually is a little bit more targeted um, insofar as it's limited to pre-conviction mugshots. So that was the um, nature of our testimony and, and, uh, and Joseph's testimony, and we'll be submitting it shortly after this hearing. And I'd be happy to take questions, of course. Thank you very much for your testimony, yeah. Mr. Bissonnette. Are there any questions for Mr. Bissonnette? Okay, uh, Senator Kahn. I'm sorry, that, Madam Chair, but uh, uh, Mr. Bissonnette, you were referring to pre-arrest mugshots. Uh, I meant, I meant pre-conviction mugshots. I'm sorry, Senator Kahn, I just slipped up. My apologies. Thank you. So these are post-arrest mugshots prior to conviction. Yes, exactly. I, I, I misspoke. My apologies. Just one, our record to be clear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions for Mr. Bissonnette? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. And who's the last one, Margaret? Scott Spradling. Okay, let's hear from Mr. Spradling. Good afternoon, Mr. Spradling. Hello, Senator. Hi, everybody. Um, Scott Spradling, representing the New Hampshire Association of Broadcasters. I was listening. I've already submitted testimony, and I wasn't actually going to speak, but I wanted to just um, throw in one last very quick uh, sentiment here. A lot of this conversation seems to be based on an assumption 
that once it's on the internet, it's out there forever. And that is in fact a false assumption. The internet can through the correct policies and perhaps a conversation where this, um, this really should be going is on the back end, not the front end. You can take care of images. They can be scrubbed from the internet. And with a policy and law that could be put in place here in New Hampshire, you would be able to control that flow of information. I think my fellow uh, media allies in the press association with Brendan specifically and with Tony have given, I think, um, very strong arguments about the need for transparency and access to information. With due respect to the ACLU and Attorney B. Sinet, he's arguing both ways. Let's, let's release all the information, but let's not release all the information. I think we're all or nothing in this conversation. I also think that there's a First Amendment um, uh, right for this information, whether it's identifiable from someone's perspective like Brendan McQuaid and the same name, and also informing a community about a potential criminal act or actor who um, uh, whose image may very well lead to a longer conversation in the legal process and proceedings. We know of many, many opportunities and times when a mugshot photo has been released to the public that has led to more information and a deeper level of investigation. I think more information is the fairer, uh, more American way here. I think limiting this on the front end is the wrong focus. I think we need to be talking about what policies can be passed on the back end to expunge the images after someone has been either found not guilty or um, a, a mistake having been made and the image can be removed. I will give as an example, if you're not, uh, if, if you're struggling to come up with one, um, the highest profile example would be um, ESPN reporter Aaron Andrews, who, uh, who had the worst of a violation against her personally when someone took images of her uh, when she was alone in a hotel room and had no clothes on. And those images were, were, were sent globally um, through the internet, those images have been expunged. There is a process by which this can be done. So to base this entire conversation on once it's out there, it can never be reeled in is false. With that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Spradling. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kahn. You, you guessed it, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Spradling, uh, the expunging of uh, images um, and doing that uh, in a retrospective manner. Um, this sounds like some federal judiciary uh, Senate uh, hearings uh, about internet uh, and internet uh, images. So uh, is there some model that we might follow that perhaps the broadcast industry or the, uh, the internet industry has suggested. Uh, that's, that's one question. The other side to this is, um, is this something you and you think your colleagues would be willing to work with us to produce some legislation for uh, the next session? Senator Khan, thank you for the question. I think structurally speaking, what Tony Shinello was talking about from patch.com, which is actually a national media outlet with state chapters and policies that are in place like that similarly around the country is the right type of model to be talking about here. Um, I agree with you. I think this is also a federal conversation and I think it's all the more reason to hold back on a piece of legislation like this so that we can have appropriate dialogue in the appropriate places. And uh, Senator, knowing you very well, I would be more than happy to be a part of that kind of a conversation to figure out what policies would work for th something like that to be able to remove and expunge. Uh, as, a, as a former reporter at WMUR-TV, I know that Hearst, um, uh, speaking as a, a former employee there, I know they have a, a very similar policy to what Tony was talking about for those that have either um, a, a mistake was made, uh, a grievous error was made, um, uh, or, or some type of record needed to be clean, cleaned and expunged and the images needed to be removed. We've done that through the news organizations before. So those policies, I don't think have ever been formalized or put into law. I mean, Gilles pointed out just a minute ago, only the state of New York has walked into this waterway uh, and, and, and worked on this kind of a policy. I think this is a very important conversation. And I think there's a way to balance this, this process so that all interests can be equally served. Uh, th thank you, Scott. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this, this is, you know, that there's the transparency 
of the media, it might be as important for the public's right to know as the transparency of law enforcement. Uh, and while the policies may be in place, I don't think the public has any insight as to how that happens. And maybe through the legislative process, we could achieve that. So uh, I'm gonna take you up on that offer and uh, follow up with the conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Spradling. Um, Margaret, are th is there anyone else? Tony Shinella. You would like to testify again? Yes, it looks like it. Okay, let's put them through for the last person. Thank you. If we were all together in the committee hearing, I'd raise my hand again just to say I'd be happy to work on anyone with that, with Scott or Senator Kahn and on uh, um, the proposal that he made. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no one else, Margaret? No other hands are raised. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing on House Bill 125. Um, we have concluded our business for the day. I will take a motion for us to adjourn. So moved. moved by Senator Gannon, seconded by Senator French. Is there any comment, questions? Right. Seeing none, I will call the roll. Senator Kahn. Yes. Senator Gannon. Oop. Sorry about that, yes. Senator Whitley. Yes. Senator French. Yes. And Senator Carson, yes. Thank you all very much. And many thanks to Jenny and Margaret for uh, helping us out today and Aaron who kicked us off. So.